Three. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. They asked me as soon as we walked into New York, Roy, did you guys feel the earthquake when you walked in? I said, no. <laughs> that was just that was just us walking in. I had to remind them. There's a lot of stuff happening. Not everything is supernatural. Right? Some things can be very easily explained. Big step is walking in. All right, let's get back to reality. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Friday night streams don't typically do these, but world's falling apart. So your boy got to step in and do a checkup. Got to give everybody some uh, updates on where the world is. Why did gold hit all-time highs? Why is crypto pulling back? What is the landscape going to look like for the next month? And of course, just to give you guys this quick recap on the DXY markup that we've had since November. Super secret magnet indicator. Can't find it on any other stream except for the Chart Addicts live streams. Has not failed me yet from level to level. The DXY is respecting the magnet indicator because the magnet indicator doesn't lie. Next stop, 107.5 for the dollar. Dollar continues to move to the upside. We're going to see a pullback on gold bigger than the one that we've already seen today. So today we're going to talk about a few reasons why gold's price ended up having a spike. I typed out this little article here for you guys. Hopefully this will give you some context about what drives gold's price and some of the biggest reasons for why gold is reacting the way it is today. And then I want to talk about one of the biggest events of the year. No, not the FX Summit 2024 conference link in the description. I'm talking about, of course, the Bitcoin having 2024. Coming up close, people. Seven days. Hold on. Why does it say April 20th? Six days, 23 hours. Seven days, six hours. Huh. Huh. Okay, so this one is more accurate. This is Watch Guru. Okay, and let's see if Binance is accurate. Yeah, Binance is going off of the nice hash. Okay, what? Everyone's got a different one. Long story short, the nineteenth and the twentieth, we have the Bitcoin having every four years. Bitcoin supply is cut in half, so the amount of Bitcoin that is produced per mining operation is now cut in half meaning it's going to be twice as expensive twice as laborious twice as hard to mine the same amount of bitcoin so whenever it's more expensive to mine if gold became twice as expensive to mine or for every hour that you spent mining gold only half the amount of gold came out the price of gold would go up so generally the halving is bullish for bitcoin however there's a lag there's usually 100 days or more between the halving and the next bull run. So don't get too discouraged over the next 100 days if Bitcoin's price or the crypto's price is not moving the way you'd like. Instead, look at it as the opportunity of a lifetime. Because now that altcoins are crashing, this is, to me, the best opportunity. When prices are pumping and everyone's making money except for you, clearly not the best feeling. And so we're always saying the same thing during a bull run. Damn, I wish I had bought more at the bottom. And then the market comes all the way back to prices where we wish we would have bought and we don't buy. And this is a vicious cycle that happens over and over. So if you want to change your life, you have to change your habits, especially your investing habits. And one of the easiest ways to do that is do the opposite of the crowds. When prices go down, you buy more, not you, not financial advice, right? One should buy more when prices dip down, as long as it's a project you believe in. And then at the tops, instead of getting greedy and thinking the market will continue forever, you cut your profits. I've seen so many crypto cycles at this point since 2014 that I've made all the mistakes. And 2017 was my biggest mistake because obviously price pumped. I didn't pull profits and I had to see a six-figure portfolio go all the way back down to 7,000. No one wants that feeling. That's why in 2020, I was able to have so much success because when price started to pump, I wasn't holding it all the way through 2021, hoping that prices were going to continue to infinity. I was pulling profits along the way because I had learned my lesson. So now I'm not in this cycle of 
like I'm, I'm off the treadmill. I'm off the hamster wheel finally. And so whenever prices dip as an investor, I see it as an opportunity. As a speculator, if you're not sure about what you're buying, you're going to be a little bit nervous. So do your research and make sure that you're confident in the things you're investing in. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Let's talk about uh, gold real quick. So obviously I want to show you guys the dollar. Talk about gold. Gold had a massive run up and then a nice retracement after we hit these highs. So gold's price typically doesn't run up this aggressively. We had a run from 2320, or sorry, 2330 up to 2430. Oh my God. That's a hundred dollar jump in the price of gold in a day. Now I've been trading for a long time. We very, very rarely see moves that big, especially at the top of a cycle. That's very strange. But then obviously nice retracement down. So one person's pump is another person's opportunity to take profits. And I think that that's what we saw here. Let's see. Okay. So let's talk about some reasons. Let's talk about gold real quick. And then we'll talk about some reasons it might have pumped. Um, go grab a drink if you guys haven't already. It's a Friday. It doesn't have to be alcoholic. Grab something to drink. Grab something to smoke. Grab something to chill with. We're going to be doing some obviously some boring work here. I'll make this part quick so we can talk about some more current events uh, that are more relevant, like the Bitcoin having. But I, I, to be honest, gold is a boring topic. Nobody here fucking owns gold unless you're wearing jewelry, right? And so it doesn't fucking matter, right? But it does because gold is one of those instruments that's intertwined between every other major financial asset. So you can't look at the dollar without looking at gold. You can't look at Bitcoin without looking at the dollar. So Gold's price really does have an anchoring effect across the market. And that's why we're going to take a look today. Um, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, drop something in the chats. Congratulations. You guys made it here on a Friday night while everybody else is wasting time becoming a victim of inflation. You're here learning how to take advantage of this next massive wave. And this stuff is not sexy, right? It's not as sexy as catching a trade in the middle of the week. When you know where the world is going, you can make money. You can protect your family. You can protect your wealth. You can build wealth. You cannot build wealth in times of just stability and everything going fine. It's very hard. During times of opportunity is the best time to build wealth. Cool. So put something in the chat if you're awake. Margaret felt very off today already from NYSE. Lots of volume, barely movement. I think the markets were spooked out because of the Iran World War II fear of escalation and conflict. Thankful to have you streaming and sharing knowledge. Malik, appreciate you being on the stream. Good to see you. All right. So let's take a look at reasons for gold. All right. So what is gold? Gold is a, typically it's a safe haven asset. So during times of economic uncertainty, war being one of those, inflation or geopolitical tensions, investors often flock to gold as a safe haven, meaning they want to park their money there because they don't feel comfortable putting it anywhere else. Okay, this means that gold is a stable store of value. Stable meaning it's not going to keep going up and down every day. And store of value means that your money is going to keep its purchasing power or keep its value over time. So you're not going to wake up tomorrow and your money's gone. Um, can't say the same about dollars because dollars lose value daily. This means they see gold as a stable store of value. Uh, this increase in demand due to safe haven buying drives the price of gold up. And so when everyone's asking me why we're seeing such an aggressive move, there's really two main reasons that the market would be betting on a strong gold, okay? Interest rates. And so if they think that interest rates are going to come down, so they're assuming that Jerome Powell will cut rates, that's a reason why gold will go up. Cutting rates hurts the power of the dollar, okay? It's bearish because there's more dollars available in the market. It's easier to get dollars because it's cheap to borrow. More supply in the market reduces the um, outstanding demand. And because there's so much supply and not enough demand chasing it, prices go down. So the value of the dollar going down drives the price of gold up. And this is the same with all assets. The more we print money, the weaker the dollar becomes, the less valuable it is. And it costs more dollars to buy the same amount of anything. Buy the same amount of gold, for example, or Bitcoin or houses. 
So a lot of the inflation we're seeing in assets and that we will see over the next five to 10 years, because if you're going to get rich, you're going to have to own assets. The inflation we're going to see is not just the prices of homes going up. It's because of the weakening of the dollar. This is something wealthy people have understood for generations. You know, inflation being 2% means that the dollar is losing 2% of its value every year. But that also means that assets are gaining value every year by default. So if you own a house 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that same house today is worth significantly more. Now, is it because celebrities moved in your neighborhood? No, the value of the dollar dropped. So interest rates is one of those reasons. And I think the market is very wrong about this one because I personally do not see Jerome Powell cutting rates unless we go into a recession, which is, you know, that's what the market's betting on. The market is betting recession and cut rates. And they're, they're betting on it very aggressively. This isn't like a there's some pocket of the market betting on a recession. It's like, no, no, the gold bulls just stepped out in full effect. And they've made their prediction very clear. And they've put their money where their mouth is. Okay, so I think we're going to start seeing a big ripple effect in the markets the next two, three weeks based on these actions. Okay. Another big reason is inflation. Obviously, if there's more inflation, the price of gold goes up. An economic slowdown, so recession, it's another big one. Uh, I personally wanted to, like, I had an idea of supply chain issues because of the war. And if the input costs of gold go up, I assumed that the price of gold would go up, but that's not that's not necessarily true. The input costs don't have too much of an effect. And so these are the main reasons that we'd be looking at. Interest rates, inflation, and recession. Recession, to me, I think is the biggest one. This and geopolitical fear are the reasons why gold is going up, in my opinion. Okay, so I've kind of broke those two things down. Uh, inflation remaining the concern. Federal Reserve is in a wait and see mode. So analysts believe the Fed might cut rate rates later in 2024 to stimulate. The anticipation of cuts is contributing to the rise in gold prices. I don't think we see rate cuts this year, but I could be wrong. The bigger one is geopolitical tensions or turmoil. So because gold is a safe haven asset, when shit goes wrong, people gravitate towards gold. Um, let's see, additional factors. Supply chain disruptions and, and global economic conditions. That's a big one. I think global economic conditions is a bigger risk right now, especially in Europe, kind of facing this economic downturn. A lot of things happening in the world, people get scared, they flock over to gold, and that's really what the market is telling us. Cool. All right, put something in the chat if you guys are good so far. We good? Okay, good, good, good. Awesome. All right, so if the DXY continues to go up, if we continue to hold these levels and continue to climb to the next targets, we can see a big pullback on gold. Big pullback on gold. If the DXY turns around and uses these areas as resistance and then starts to make its way back down, then gold will continue to the upside. All right, I had a $3,000 target for gold. I was expecting 2025 for the 3000 target at this rate, we really might hit that target sooner. All right. So I'm expecting more upside for gold, but maybe just uh, right now we see a little bit of a pullback and then we're able to continue whenever you have a big run up and then you see these big wicks on gold, a lot of selling. You typically, this is institutional selling or pension funds. You have a nice pullback of the impulse, probably around 50%. So we could go as far as 50%, maybe even a little bit lower before continuing, which would put us a couple hundred points lower. All right. So those are the bear and bull cases. I do believe the dollar has more room to the upside. And so I think that the gold retracement is in. Let's talk Bitcoin real quick. So cryptos had a pretty tough day just in terms of pullbacks. This is something that we've been talking about for months. Uh, I'm anticipating a lot of action near the Bitcoin having. 
And I'd like to see price come back down to the 60,000 range. Sort of, like I said, play in a box before the halving. Around the halving, I'd love to see a pullback. And then maybe around November, we start the next bull run. Maybe sooner, maybe October, September, but more than likely November. All right. This is my prediction based off of previous Bitcoin halvings and how the markets reacted. A lot of people say Bitcoin halvings are bullish, which is true, but they don't really think about the timeline. So they expect, okay, supply gets cut in half, time to rock and roll. The reality is in the short term, there's a massive disruption from the Bitcoin halving. Smaller mining operations, their costs just went up 2x. The amount of power and electricity it requires to mine the Bitcoin just doubled if they want to make the same money. If they like making half the money, then they can keep spending the same. So smaller miners get pushed out of the, the business because it's just not profitable anymore. Large mining pools have to pick up that slack and pick up all the extra mining responsibility that was left by the smaller mining pools. And that, that in a short term, drives the price of Bitcoin down. Because the network takes a hit, it's a lot slower. People stop using Bitcoin because there's other more attractive assets to use for payments. And that lack of demand typically makes Bitcoin's price go sideways or retraces a little bit. And then in the longer term, we realize the demand is still there. The amount of holders versus on-chain traders or on-chain activity is looking very healthy. That's when investors start to get back in. This could be around, if there is an interest rate cut, this could be around that time. It's around the elections, more certainty, more money flowing in because investors are not going to invest before the election. Four or five months ahead of the election, no, no new investment activity is going to be taking place uh, amongst the biggest investing firms. They're going to be in a hold and chill mode once there's clarity as to who's president and what the regulatory and legal and economic environment will look like then they're going to go and deploy their capital but until then i think we see a lot of money on the sidelines leading up number one to the october surprise which is a political sort of like a, an annual thing that happens during election seasons where something very shocking happens to sway the direction of the election so I don't think that we're going to see any big, big moves in crypto before that October surprise. Cool. Gold too simple, brother. Been pumping since 1810. Been holding since then. Awesome. I thought you meant the year for a second. I was like, buddy, who are you, who are you fooling? Yeah, fucking 1810. My God. What is in the Spanish-American War? Buddy fucking, buddy was in the, um, God, what, what the fuck happened in 1810? Is that Civil War or is that too early? Yeah, 1776. Then you get 1792, 1798. What is that? Spanish American War? One of those. Who gives a fuck? Okay. Um, what else are we missing here? Oh, another big reason for Bitcoin doing so well is the students who are successful at the NAS 100 Masterclass are buying up all the Bitcoin. So if you haven't already secured your seat for the next NAS 100 Masterclass, April 24th to the 27th, click the link in the description to sign up. This is a four-day masterclass where we cover my strategy from top to bottom, my exact execution criteria, my weekly schedule for how I day trade NAS 100, and the exact system I use every morning trading live with you on YouTube. So if you guys want to get nice like me with day trading NASDAQ, this is class is going to be the one-stop shop. Make sure to click the link in the description to secure your seat. Interesting point about the elections. Yeah, I've seen enough elections to know that it doesn't matter who wins. The markets don't care about the outcome. And this is going to be one of the most valuable things you guys take away from today's stream. When you're looking at fundamentals and you're asking yourself what are the big investors thinking, always remind yourself they don't give a fuck which way it goes. Who wins, who loses, whether they cut rates or don't cut rates. Institutions know how to make money regardless. What they really like is clarity. Let me know what my life is going to look like for the next six months so I can plan. And I'm happy as an investor. If you're telling me the next six months are going to look like this, and I don't know when to buy, when to sell, or what to do, 
as an investor, I'm going to be very unhappy. Whether rates are 5%, 10%, 0%, doesn't matter. Does this concept make sense? That's why uh, the market, that's why the biggest question I get as a fundamental trader, and I know I trade technicals, but my biases are always based on fundamental market cycles. The biggest question I get is, Roy, if the news came out negative for the U.S. economy, why is the price going up? Okay, so in other words, why is the market doing the opposite of what it should based on this news? And it's the same concept that hopefully you guys will remember after the stream, which is the market does not care about the specific data point. They care about like three, four months of data after each other because it, it points towards the story. But they don't care about the exact inflation rate getting from three to two or whatever. What they look for is stability. What they look for is the Fed having control, like everything is under control. What they look for is clarity and predictability. So is the environment stable enough for me to predict what the next six months will look like? If the answer is no and it's too volatile, then typically investors would choose to be on the sidelines and not take risk rather than engage. Right? This is a lesson you guys can take from the big investors. Don't trade during times of complete uncertainty. Right, Just keep your money on the sidelines. Keep it safe until it's ready to deploy. Put a one in the chat if this makes sense. Yeah, this was one of my biggest takeaways from working at Merrill because a lot of people ask me um, what of my professional experience I was able to translate over or was able to translate over to retail trading. And the answer is not much. But the perspective of having a clearly outlined plan. Like guys at Merrill, we were doing life plans for people 30 years out. So everybody has different financial goals. And imagine somebody has a financial goal of in 30 years, my kids will be in school. Their college would have already been paid off because of the investments we're making today. They want to get a beach home and then they want to have complete, be completely debt-free. And so we're investing in things today and we're finding out what dollar amount do we need to invest today to get you those results in 30 years. So the amount of planning that we're doing is so specific that, that it has to yield this result in 30 years. Otherwise, we have failed this person. Okay, and we have an obligation to do right by them. So as a trader, when I went over and I saw how much short-term thinking there was and how much short-term gratification and expectations there were, I realized it's impossible to hit long-term goals or any meaningful goal operating on such a short Time frame, short expectations, two two days, one week, my weekly results, right? My monthly results. Monthly and weekly results are uh, the most misleading information you could possibly get. You could have a bad month, believe it or not, right? So that's one of those big lessons I learned is obviously a longer term approach. But when it as it relates to fundamentals, one of my biggest takeaways was the decoupling between the data point the news that came out, and then the actual price reaction. And once I learned that Merrill and Bank of America invests in, let's say, six months, 18 months, three years, five years, 10-year intervals, now I'm not thinking, oh, Bank of America just sold off a bunch of this because of this one news. No, 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 no. Everything is pre-planned. Because what they think is, if the market does this, then we will sell you know, X amount of our portfolio of gold at this price. It's all already planned and they have the prices already marked off because these are discounted or premium prices based on when they invested, based on the price that they bought Bitcoin or gold. These are prices that make sense for them to sell and make sense for them to buy. And so when you guys see me day trade, I'm basing my understanding of the levels that I'm watching off of this, uh, like this is the premise, is that price will go to this area first before launching because this is the discounted price that is ideal for all the investors and all the traders, regardless of when they bought in. If they come back to this price and they're able to buy it up at this price, they'll all make money. And so there's certain areas where it makes so much sense for institutions to be sitting because of the potential to make money. And that's where we look for um, buying and selling zones. Make sense? Who fucking knows? All right. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Interesting point about elections. They all have inside game anyways. By the dip, it's the only way to go. Friday night keys. Exactly. So you guys know that I'm typically not doing too much education during the week. 
But if you either don't have anything else going on or are willing to come and invest in yourself to learn on a Friday night instead of fucking God knows what else you could be doing, then you deserve about as much information as I can get out in 30 minutes. Okay, so that's my goal here. Congratulations for investing in yourself. Right, because usually when I used to do this, all my friends would be partying. I'd be at home studying, studying the charts, using the replay feature on trading view, have some music in, listening to Mark Douglas or whatever else. And there is zero gratification there. You only get gratified when you see your performance on the charts when you're when it's time to play. So this is hopefully something that will gratify you all, which is a specific stream dedicated to those who are the most dedicated and sort of just me giving back to the person who I like, I'm giving back to my old self who I wish had gotten some attention and recognition when I was studying my ass off and making sacrifices. So that's what we're doing here tonight, people. So with the Bitcoin having, will Bitcoin drop first? Yes. Trying to get a better understanding of the having. So typically it'll either dip. So in which case my expectation is 50K or lower, or it'll just go sideways. So in 60 to 70K, just go sideways. Either way, the lower that price gets, the more attractive it is for us to buy. Um, the way that I'm personally investing in Bitcoin during the halving is dollar cost averaging. And uh, like my methodology for dollar cost averaging a bit different than most. I use a bit of a martingale approach, which is the lower it gets, the more I put in. So if I have $1,000 to invest, okay, and price comes down to like 63 I'm not going to put more than 100 bucks. Okay, price comes down to 58. I'll put 200 bucks. Price comes down to 53. I'll put 400 bucks. Okay, so now I've invested 700 total. I still have 300 on the sidelines. Actually, this should be 300. My apologies, guys. 300. That's 600 right here. And then price hits 49 or 50K. I put the rest of the $400 right here. So you can see the orders I'm putting in are getting bigger and bigger as price dips because I bought $400 of Bitcoin at 50K. And I only bought $100 of Bitcoin at 65K. So my $100 is now probably sitting at $75. But by the time the market goes from 50K back up to 70, what is that an increase of? 40%? So by the time the market goes up 40%, my $400 will be up 40%. Okay, so the bigger positions will yield you a much higher return because you're buying at a much cheaper price. So whatever 40% of 400 is, uh, that's what we'll get. Okay? So... Dollar cost average on the way down. And if the market just hits like the this area, you put in your 200 and then it starts to take off. This is this is part of the reality of markets. If we knew exactly where the bottom price was, we'd all be trillionaires, right? Because I'm not going to put 400 down here. I'm going to go sell my kidneys. I'm going to go borrow money from anybody I know. And I'm going to put it all in if I knew exactly where it was. And so because we don't know where the bottom is, that's why we need a dollar cost average averaging strategy. That way we can make money, get invested, enter at the right prices, maximize our return without having to guess the bottom, right? Trying to play God is one of the easiest ways to blow all your money in the markets. Trying to predict exactly when the market's going to turn around or at what price. Uh, newsflash, even institutions don't know because if they did, then they would all be the number one hedge fund. They wouldn't just be one big player and the rest of them are lagging. Correct? Uh, okay, bet. This makes a lot of sense. Thank you. For sure. Tip Hennenberg. You already know the drill. All right. Anything you guys want to talk about? Any news you guys saw in the Forex space? Anything that caught your eye that you guys want to open up the convo about? What's going on? What's on y'all's mind? What, what are you guys seeing that's a potential, a potentially important here?
You said, what's up with Tesla houses? Oh, wait. Yo, if you guys have not finished your final exam, if you guys took the master class early April and have not finished your exam, please go through and do so as soon as possible. So you guys can get your free access, your free general admission ticket, and your free 30 days VIP access into the chart addicts group chat where every day and every way we're getting paid. Traders are crushing it. It's the best interactive community in the world. Make sure you guys finish off that final exam so you can get access. Tesla is making houses. All right, let's see what this is. Off my first thought is this is stupid. Like my very, very first initial reaction, but that's because I'm a judgmental, uh I'm a judgmental dickhead. Let's put it that way. So originally. Like initial, my initial reaction is this is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard of in my life. Okay. Um, this is like Apple making self-driving cars. It's like they had zero shot to begin with. I don't know what they were thinking. Google had a chance. They fucked it up big time, right? Tesla, no shot. Or sorry, Apple, no shot. But Tesla making homes. Take control of your environment. So it's a smart home. It's an iPhone on wheels. Ultimate autonomous homes that integrate your technology into your home. So it's a smart home, basically. You guys ever seen that Disney movie, Smart House? This might be before some of y'all's time, but who's seen Smart House? Green, so it's sustainable. Uh, hurricane rated. Okay, technology, power storage is EV ready. Uh, beta house elevation. Okay. Huh. What are we? What are we doing here? I'm so confused. What is happening? Tesla Homes, a premier uh, development firm, sustainable development, renovation, construction, beauty and technology, invest in emerging markets and add value added across the U.S. with the most reputable private equity partners. Oh, they got Chris Cascone. This guy used to be in the doctor's office. It was him and fucking Rachel Ray. And that dude, Ryan, whatever this, his name is, from Million Dollar Listings. Not a bad choice. Not a bad choice. Marathon, Florida? But that's right down the street from me. What the fuck? Dana Myers, charismatic, talented, salesperson of the year. Huh. So is this related to Tesla is the real question. Whoa, their contact page just took me to a fucking, oh my God. Okay, yeah, this is the sketchiest fucking site I've ever seen. Like, I, I did. You know what I'm saying? 1.1 1. 1 million? I came across a YouTube video. It cost 15000 per home? Okay. Look, they called him crazy when he first tried to build autonomous driving cars. And then now... That he wants to build smart houses, make them cheaper and make them more accessible and renewable and all these things. We're gonna, he's going to get clowned. But if there's anyone that can fucking build a house, for fuck's sake, it's Elon. All right. And if you guys don't know what it takes to build rockets, because I, I really feel this like it's the stupidest people on, on planet Earth that love to talk about Elon. Because obviously they don't understand a fucking thing about anything he's doing. And so they're just like, oh, do this guy. Da, da, da. Right. Literally not realizing they're talking about one of the greatest minds 
of the last 200 years. Go look up what it takes to send a rocket to space and back without, you know, off a single uh, single use. Like basically being able to use the same rocket and have it land and then be all the parts still be intact. Go and look up the physics involved. And you're going to see one of those equations, right? Just one of the simple ones to turn on a light in the fucking spaceship, just to turn on the bathroom light and your brain's going to explode. And then you're going to start to realize the millions and millions of equations that have to go into all these different things that he's building. And some of the most complicated projects that human history has ever seen. Motherfuckers, if he can't put four walls and a goddamn roof together, we're fucked. We ain't never seeing Mars, goddamn it. If, we, if he can't fucking put a carpet and four fucking walls together and some power outlets and some running water, we are fucked. We need a new plan for this nuclear war. I ain't never making it to fucking Mars if he can't build houses. So I'm a bet on Elon and I'm gonna buy one of these houses if it's possible. He said the bottom site on Tesla homes scroll down. What? I don't know if Elon's involved in Tesla homes. We'll get to it, though. Figure out more about this. Elon is our version of Nikola Tesla. Um, I'd say he's more of our version of Edison. Because, well, Elon is an inventor. But we have to think about, like, the last four companies. Uh, Neuralink. Tesla. SpaceX. And I think there was one more. I forgot what it was. All of these were founded by someone else, but he basically bought, ended up buying the company, giving them the grant, and then making it a legitimate company. Being able to give them the resources and give them the direction and vision to actually put their resources and their findings to the test. So he, he'll, he'll like find Neuralink, who already has a tested sort of prototype of this technology, but he will use his engineering sort of acumen to be able to guide them towards what the real objective is which is can everybody become a superhuman they're like bro no this is going to be for parkinson's and he's like well how can we make it possible to be superhuman and they're like it's just, it's not possible because you guys know how scientists are they're always like yeah i can't do it oh no it's not possible no you can't do it and then the visionary will come in and be like well get it done by tomorrow and they'll be like what we can't it's impossible it's impossible i'm like well it's either that or you lose your job and then they do it and then all of a sudden you know People can type with their brain just by thinking like this is really how he works. Visionaries, same with Ford, same with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs would come in and say, I want all the world's information in my pocket. They'll be like, you're out of your fucking mind, you crackpot. And he'll say, you're right. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning. And then they'll get it done. And then we have the iPhone, right? Same with the Model T. So I'd say probably more like Edison. Or Ford, but combination of both. All right. Uh, thank you for showing up for us on a Friday. Definitely appreciate it. Y'all already know the drill. Uh, I do have to hop off here because I have so much work. But as you guys know, I use these streams to productively procrastinate from doing all the back-end work that I know I need to get done in the next two hours before the day closes. So I appreciate y'all hopping on, man. If I can, I'm going to hang out here for another 10, 15 minutes because I'm definitely not ready to get back to it. Um, so if you guys have any questions, want to chop it up about anything, let me know. Let me know. Drop your questions in the chat. And we'll go through those.
I know world issues have market effect, but I'm just rewatching masterclass and back testing the strategy. Exactly. Look, at the end of the day, the best traders who come out of the masterclasses are the ones that are going to be so focused on just is the system or is the strategy available today? Nope, it's not. Let me move on. The person like th those of you that can get that simple with trading will be the most successful. And the times where I'm finding the most success are where someone will tell me about a fundamental event or something, and I'm just finding out about it after we made money. And they're like, oh, did you guys take that buy at the live stream because of, uh, you know, the interest rates in Japan nearing the zero bound, whatever? No, the fuck no. Fuck no. The strategy is way too simple for that. Okay, so are you going to lose trades by completely ignoring everything and not knowing when the high volume, you know, moments are coming? Yeah, of course. You got to watch for the speed bumps along the way. Do you need to look at fundamentals to make money if you have a clearly defined mechanical edge that is step by step? The answer is no. You show up on the charts, the market is either presenting the edge or it is not. And on high impact news days, the market will not present the edge. It'll have blown through too many levels. It will have too many missing pieces. Okay. And that is going to be your indication that not the best time to trade. Versus trying to outsmart the largest institutions in the world. Like, well, so if, and this is what I used to, this is what I used to do. I used to do a day by day trying to trade fundamentals using the news of the day. Uh, about the stupidest thing I've ever done, right? It's going to be impossible. And plus, institutions throw out so much false info to mess with traders. It's unreal, there's an old uh, Jim Cramer interview where he explains inside trading. This is why I fucking hate Jim Cramer, right? Because he's stupid enough to actually have said this on national television, this fucking fraudster. This guy goes and he's talking about all the insider trading that happens on Wall Street. People can't make money on Wall Street unless there's insider trading. This is what I've realized because they're all, they're all too fucking greedy and they don't spend enough time actually doing the work to make real investment decisions. The best investors in America are not on Wall Street. Let's be completely honest about this. Uh, I mean, Warren Buffett's in Omaha, for Christ's sakes. Ray Dalio's in Greenwich, Connecticut. Why? Because they need, they're somewhere quiet, actually doing the work and looking at the data. On Wall Street, it's just edges, high-frequency trading now, uh, insider trading, and just sort of like buddy-buddy investing, where it's like, hey, guys, just got a tip from, you know, PIMCO. They said that Tesla's, numbers came out, whatever, whatever. So insider trading. Jim Cramer talks about how the rumor mill where investors or these investment firms or these Wall Street companies will put out a false report, get the whole market uh, on a bearish sentiment, get some selling pressure entering the market, and then smash buys in the opposite direction of everyone. Number one, because they need liquidity on the other side so that they can execute their buys, so they need sellers. And so they'll uh, try to drive sellers in the market by any means necessary. And sometimes the you know sometimes they will sell off a massive order just to drive price down, just so the market panics and starts selling, just so they can buy it up at the cheapest price. They'll have the market do the work for them to drag price down to a certain level, and then they will capitalize on that discount by buying up massive orders. And then there's enough liquidity now in the market from these short sellers so that they can you know, have their trade executed. You guys are getting the real sauce today. It's a Friday. It's a Friday. Yep, and if you're from the industry and you've tried to contact me and I am not responding, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you that I'm going to respond to your message and I'll, I'll see it and, and all this stuff. Chances are I ain't seeing it, right? If it's really, if it's urgent, call me. If you don't have my number, it ain't urgent. Okay. In which case, we have links on the website. Schedule a call with me. If it's about the FX Summit, please reach out to info at FX Summit 2024 or anybody on my team and they'll make sure to put it high priority. Okay. 
I should have just said this. If you're from the industry and you need me, yeah, fucking don't. All right? You just don't need me. Okay? I'll be back when I'm back. So 6852 is a good level to buy again. Alfonso ain't paying attention. Alfonso, Jesus Christ. This is, I remember you from the, like, you you were, you had me so frustrated last week, I still remember your name. What's your strategy based on uh, three main concepts, John Wayne? First, it's very simple, supply and demand. So just kind of support resistance. That's the number one basis. Direction is the largest piece because most traders are just kind of trading ranges like both sides, buys and sells. I prefer to only trade in the direction of the trend. So that's a big one. And then it's based off of like uh, two larger concepts, which is Wyckoff theory, which is how I look at trading ranges and the anatomy of a trading range. Elliott wave theory, which is kind of how far are we into a trend? So in trending markets, I use more Elliott waves. In consolidating markets, I'm more focused on Wyckoff. And then I use kind of a variation of the market maker model with my own twist uh, to do executions. So it's basically like a love child. Wyckoff, Elliott wave, market maker model. And then, of course, years of fucking grind and hard work to refine the execution, the risk strategy, and the scaling methods. My favorite fighters of USC 300... Tough question, Robin. Tough question because I love this card. Um, shit, I'd have to say Max Holloway and Gaethje. Hands down. My favorites. I love Yuri Prohaska. I'm actually very, very... I'm looking forward to seeing him fight again after the, his previous loss. I wish he would have taken a little bit more time, but I think this one's going to be good for him. God, there's so many good fights on this card. Dude, imagine Cody Garbrandt is fighting... Um, Shit, who is he fighting? Oh, dude, Davison Figueredo. One of the greatest fighters in UFC bantamweight history. And then, of course, the legend himself, Cody Garbrandt, one of my favorite fighters, one of the most explosive, one of the most talented and skilled. Like, I got to watch his fights on half speed when I rewatch him on YouTube. He's that fucking good. Uh, so, yeah, I just think tomorrow's card is something where I'm blocking off, like I'm time blocking for UFC 300 tomorrow. No Pereira. I love, I love Pereira, but I'm not... I, I don't idolize people that are like uh, natural freaks, right? So like even in trading or in life, you find someone who's a natural specimen. And not to say that Alex ha doesn't have incredible training because he is a kickboxing champion and he has hundreds of fights damn near. But he is a genetic fucking freak. The density of his bones, the, uh, the size of his hands. They did a UFC PI uh, test where he fucking punched the machine. Got a, he had a harder punch than Francis Naganu by like 30,000 points. What, he had the hardest punch. It's like being hit by a, a slow moving truck, like 40 miles an hour. That is, that's fucking insane. So that's not something you can train. That's not a championship mindset and a heart of a, a warrior and all these things. I, I really just feel like that's just him. Right. So I like to pride the, the people that I see that are just, it's built. This is not given. This was not, this is made stuff. Uh, those are the people that I look up to. This is them leg kicks. Yeah, Pereira's going to fuck Jamal Hill up. All right, if Jamal Hill was 100%, I'd give it a fair fight, and Jamal has a very good chance of knocking out Pereira. Brother, with a, with a torn Achilles, like, I don't even know why the why he would be stupid enough to step in there. Like, this is the easiest prediction, is that his he will have zero ligaments left in his leg after Pereira kicks him twice. He will knock the fucking ligaments right off of his leg. All right? Torn Achilles with only nine months of recovery? Are you fucking crazy? I don't care how many stem cells they shoot you up with at the UFCPI. A leg is a leg, brother. We're all human. Okay. Uh, I'm losing a bunch of people. The trade talk is done. Not a lot of UFC fans in here, so I guess we'll call it a night, people. I'm going to get back to work finally. Steve, Roy sending my flowers from PA. Steve, I appreciate you more than you know, bro. Thank you. All right, everybody, take it easy. Happy safe trading next week. I'll catch you guys on the Sunday Market Outlook. Peace.